Hey everyone, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. This is my third video on Robert Musil's The Man Without Qualities. Uh, I have been calling it a, a three video series. Now I believe it's going to be at least a four video series because I wanted to take uh, this video and just concentrate on the 200, uh, roughly 200 pages of the immediate uh, posthumous material following the novel proper that was published in his lifetime. Um, these are chapters 39 through 58, roughly, in the Knopf hardcover. <clears throat> it's pages uh, 1135 through 1311, so, you know, just shy of 200 pages, but as uh, we've now shifted from the translator Sophie Wilkins, over to Burton Pike, uh, and as he points out in his preface, these were uh, given back uh, from the publisher to Musel in, in galley proofs, um, and he started to revise them, and then he withdrew them all together to make um, further uh, revisions, and, uh, and of course they, they were never published in his lifetime. So the purpose of these uh, chapters uh, is to continue into the millennium, uh, but not conclude it. In these sections, we only really deal with four characters, Agata and Ulrich, General Stum, and Lindner, or Professor Lindner. Um, and really there's a fifth, his son Peter, but we don't, you know, he's more tertiary. So while I do have to lament um, the absence of Clarissa and Voltaire and Musbrugger and Diotima, and so on, um, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily by design that Musil left them out. It was just the fact that these are the characters and situations he wanted to focus on for this next chunk. Uh, certainly the novel was going to be much bigger. Um, and we still have a lot more posthumous material uh, to focus on, lots of sketches and drafts. Um, and essays, if you will, um, using different characters. So in the next and or fourth video, I'll be going over uh, all the the sketches and extra stuff. Um, I just didn't want to include it with this video because I didn't want things to start getting confusing as to what actually happened um, in the novel proper versus the first chunk of galley proofs that he was editing and and then what was sort of in his uh, table drawers. Themes that come out in these uh, 200 pages, um, the loss of individuality, um, the role and, and practice of faith, science and art, the tyranny of metrics and performance. For example, he says, life was becoming more and more homogenous and impersonal. Something mechanical, stereotypical, statistical, and serial was insinuating itself into every entertainment, excitement, recreation, even into the passions. And I deal with this a lot. I'm in IT and especially in big data and data analytics. Um, and the way things are now, they want to uh, quantify everything. Um, and, and I've heard it referred to, I think there's even a book that recently came out called The Tyranny of Metrics but we're constantly being driven to perform better, perform better, perform better. Um, and it's crossing over into what used to be qualitative, such as the emotions. And the emotions is the other uh, predominant theme. In fact, um, there are uh, long stretches of Agatha reading uh, papers that she has found in Ulrich's drawers where he has been uh, giving lots and lots of uh, deep philosophical thought into the emotions. We get a much more sensuous and poetic uh, Musel slash his surrogate Ulrich. For example, every strong excitement that two people have shared to the end leaves behind in them the naked intimacy of exhaustion. If even arguing does this, then it is infinitely more true of tender feelings that ream out the very marrow to form a flute. And this comes in the height of uh, a, a very charged uh, episode between Agatha and Ulrich. The parallel campaign, as, as we suspected, um, has petered out. It's been supplanted by the Congress for World Peace. 
um, once again, you know, there's this shift from ideas to action um, and, and this rallying against Austrian nationalism that was um, rolled into the parallel campaign. There's definitely a marked shift in tone and pace um, in, in these portions of the novel. Uh, like I said, Agatha discovers some pages in Ulrich's drawer um, that, sh that we get here verbatim. Um, and they're long stretches. Um, they, it's basically chapters 52, 54, and 55 and that are, that are uh, composed of the contents of these writings. Um, they are dry. Um, I found myself not very able to stick with them. I had to keep starting over and so on to kind of follow the thread. Um, some people, of course, may get a lot out of this. Um, I'm, it is definitely a really interesting change in the novel that suddenly, you know, uh, Musel was was obsessed with getting these into the work because obviously if he was uh, spending so much time slowly and meticulously working on these, I would suspect that these are the portions he was most concerned about. So his framework um, or his system of the emotions was very important to him um, and especially uh, perhaps uh, contra the other uh, philosophers and, and uh, psychologists of the day and their take on emotions. Like Janice Grill, sorry if that's a mispronunciation, uh, but Janice Grill is a Musel uh, scholar. She's been helping a lot of us on the group read on Twitter. Uh, she pointed out to me that Musel was not a Freudian. Uh, he didn't like Krauss or a Freud. Um, and we get that clue. I read it after Janice uh, pointed that out to me, but we get this clue uh, where as Agatha is looking through these papers that I'm talking about, it says, as far as Agatha could see, he had not taken psychoanalysis into account. And this surprised her at first, for like all people stimulated by literature, she had heard it spoken of more than other kinds of psychology. So it is, Freud came in and, and made this very, very popular. Freud, of course, was obsessed with uh, Shakespeare, loved Hamlet, um, and all kinds of literature, Don Quixote, um, and, and it had like literature clubs and so on. Um, but again, we see that um, it was a, a glaring omission uh, and therefore a very deliberate omission on Ulrich slash uh, Musel's part. And chapters 57 and 58 that conclude this section continue the discourse on emotions, but away from the perspective um, uh, of uh, Agatha reading the papers and now we're in the present action with Ulrich pacing his garden um, and it gives you kind of it kind of makes you visualize uh, Kant um, wandering around and philosophizing. Lindner's character um, who we get um, at the very end of uh, Into M the Millennium Proper um, and his character Em embodies this possibility of a life of high moral standing. Um, he's empathetic, he's virtuous, he's tall, he's obsessed with cleanliness and health. He makes everything a moral imperative. For example, it says here, Lindner transformed absolutely everything he came in contact with into a moral imperative. He's a planner, he has a rigid daily schedule. Um, and so there are compliments to Ulrich's life, uh, you know, obsession with health, he's working out and, and rigorous and so on. Um, but in a sense, Lindner is the opposite of Ulrich in terms of, you know, spirituality versus science. They're both after um, figuring out the best way to live and, and how to um, gain a moral standing. Um, but Lindner is approaching this from a spiritual um, context, whereas Ulrich is, is approaching this from a scientific and uh, context of precision. We get this image, this, this literal picture um, above Lindner's desk, and it says, the window beside Lindner's desk was adorned with a colorful showpiece of glass, representing a knight who, with a prim gesture, was liberating a maiden from a dragon. So this represents um, not only uh, his character in general, um, you know, that he would have this on his wall and sees himself as this knight, but also the maiden, um, you know, it's a, it's a Gata who's looking at this picture as she's in his house uh, waiting for him to, to, to come to her. Um, you know, she, I suppose, sees herself in a, in a way as the maiden. You know, he, 
he has already earlier been somewhat condescending and condemning of her idea of getting divorced uh, from Hagauer, and uh, <clears throat> and but this she's she's enamored uh, by him, and she, her interest in Lindner is piqued. Um, and so she's there almost as the, the maiden in peril. We could also look as the dra at the dragon in many ways. Um, two uh, of which come to mind uh, are Ulrich. You know, um, she is, you know, in Ulrich's mind, they're supposed to, you know, completely disappear from the public eye and just have each other. Um, and then also we can see the dragon as her husband. Um, at least in her eyes, you know, as a suppressive force um, that, you know, that she, she never really wanted to get married in general and she's never gotten over her first love. And Ulrich, of course, is jealous. Uh, like I said, he viewed, um, he viewed their meeting each other um, as a means to, um, as a means to renounce the world and just have each other. The strongest statements on that view from Ulrich uh, about he and Agata comes on page 1190. He doesn't want this to become just another love story, she thought, and added, that's not my inclination either. And immediately thereafter she thought, he will love no other woman after me, for this is no longer a love story. It is the very last love story there can be. So again, we see this, this intense, intimate heightening um, between Ulrich and Agatha, um, yet there's now this third party, Lindner, um, that's drawing Agatha away. Um, and, and on the flip side of that, from uh, Lindner's perspective, um, Agatha, her personality coming into his life, um, she is really putting all of his moral inclinations to the test. Hey, here's a good reminder from Musel to critics. Especially in art, most of us certainly know it would be possible for us to do ourselves to do ourselves what we read, see, and hear. But we still have the patronizing awareness that if we were able to do any of these things, we could of course do them better. I love that. Very snarky. We remember that Wittgenstein and uh, Musel were contemporaries. Uh, let's, we keep that in mind when we read, because the world isn't ruled by reason, but must be dominated by iron logic. Here's a great way to sort of sum up the man without qualities. Altogether, it formed a collection of fragments whose inner coherence was not immediately apparent. I'd like to step back from my own thoughts for a moment and share uh, portions of an essay that uh, author Rick Harsh shared with me. Um, he is the author of Skulls of Istria and also The Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas, which is on its way to my house. I cannot wait to read and review that on here. Um, he is a remarkable thinker and writer. Um, he, uh, he's for, he is um, an American and he is um, now in self-imposed exile in Istria. And this essay, which is a, a treat to read, um, it's called The Territory of Literature. Musel, Joyce, and Rilke as Slovenes. And so he's got this thesis of showing the Slovenic character elements of, of each of these giants of modernism. And so this is the bolstering of his thesis. For the purposes of this note, a Slovene is a writer, which by my definition is someone without a nation in that his works defy human constructs, such as territorial boundaries, who has been given, who has been affected to some degree by proximity to territory inhabited by Slovenes. Given that the definition precludes attachment to the state of Slovenia, the case is easily made that Rilke, Joyce, and Musel, in that, in that they are, were in no way Slovene by birth or cultural assimilation, are more than adequately qualified to be called Slovenes. As for Musel, one need only check the birth records, for he was born in Klagenfurt, a city that, especially at that time, was the seat of a Slovene countryside. Musel was the least fortunate of the three in at least one sense. He was forced by some wicked flippage of invisible wings to take upon himself the task of analyzing the elements that converged into the war. Musel attempted the impossible to write a single book to explain the inexplicable. He did not fail because he did not finish. 
Anyone who is not going to read Musil but would like to grasp his essence and his diagnostics, I recommend the successive chapters, So Kill Him, 118, and A Countermine and a Seduction, 119. So again, he goes into an explication of those. Um, I'll let you go back and read those first and see what you make of it. So again, that's just a very, very small snippet um, and of the portions that relate to Musil. Um, the entire essay is wonderful, and uh, not only because of his thoughts um, and his supporting evidence, but also just um, because of the type of writer that Rick is. He's very, uh, very keen, very, very clever. Um, and playful. But I like how he singled out um, of the three, of Joyce, Rilke, and Musel. Musel was the one who took, uh, took on this impossible task of creating one novel, you know, that would explain um, how the atrocities of World War uh, I or the Great War um, came about. And also, I agree with him that chapters 118 and 119 really do for anyone who's not going to read Musil or, or at least wants to get a taste of what they're in for, um, could grasp his essence and his diagnostics. Um, now, he had, Rick had already mentioned those to me before, and I reread them, and I, I was struck by other parts of them. In fact, the first time I had read them, I was struck by both of them. They're outstanding chapters, um, but the evidence he gives is, is different. From, from what I got out of it and, uh, and really opened my eyes. Those are my thoughts um, on the posthumous papers um, that had at least been to the publisher um, and were in review and revision uh, by Musel up to his death. Uh, I'm going to create another video, a fourth video of all the extra material that's in here. We've got about 370 some more pages um, that are but selections of what's available. So these are just the portions that have been translated from the German, um, but they're mainly sketches and ideas, um, even notes that he made about the novel, but should be very interesting. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're enjoying the series on Musil. And uh, if you're reading it, um, I can see on Twitter that a lot of us are enjoying it um, and posting some great selections. If you haven't read it yet, it's not too late. Um, and it may be time to uh, take the plunge.